On this edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue begins a series on prayer. If you don't have time to pray, then there's something wrong with your priorities <laughs> because God is our first priority and our relationship with Him needs to be first. So that time you spend with God will enable you to be more loving, will be enable you to be more effective in whatever tasks you have to do. Today we're going to begin a series on personal prayer and in particular on using the scriptures in our prayer life. Prayer is very important for the life of any Christian and it's central to growing in holiness. I'd like to quote for you uh, a Pope John Paul II's encyclical on the new millennium where he speaks about the importance of prayer. He writes, this training in holiness calls for a Christian life distinguished above all in the art of prayer. So prayer is both liturgical when we gather together for mass or for other gatherings, but it's also personal prayer that our Holy Father spoke about and the importance of. So if we're going to have a vital Christian life, we need to be people of prayer. And the wisdom of the saints is that we need a vibrant personal prayer life. It's not just sort of getting it done or getting my prayer time in, but really encountering the Lord in prayer each day. So prayer is described by John Paul II as a genuine dialogue of love. It's a friend speaking to a friend. It's learning from the Lord and revealing, disclosing oneself to the lover of our souls. And when we do this, when we get into this dialogue of love, this is where we'll find we're really going to start to grow in our relationship with God. And things will change within us. We'll become more like Christ, the one that we are in dialogue with. So if we have shallow prayer, then we're going to become what Pope John Paul II calls Christians at risk. He writes, they would run the insidious risk of seeing their faith progressively undermined and would perhaps end up succumbing to the allure of substitutes, accepting alternative religious proposals, and even indulging in far-fetched superstitions. And unfortunately, we do see this happening among Christians who maybe don't have uh, a commitment to prayer, oftentimes will get caught up in other things. It's like a spiritual vacuum. If you're not getting the real thing, then you're gonna look for substitutes. If you don't have an authentic prayer life, then that hunger, that spiritual hunger, is gonna be satisfied in some other way. We're gonna build up some kind of false idol instead of the real thing, Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the model for us for how to pray. And I'd just like to quote some excerpts from an instruction on the Liturgy of the Hours that describes how Christ prayed and what we can learn from his prayer life. The Gospels very frequently show us Christ at prayer, when his mission is revealed by the Father, before he calls his apostles, when he blesses God at the multiplication of the loaves, when he's transfigured on the mountain, when he heals the deaf mute, when he raises Lazarus, on and on. There's all these times Jesus will pray and then work his signs and wonders, accomplish his ministry. Later, uh, in the same document, it, it states, to the very end of Jesus' life, as his passion was approaching at the Last Supper, in the agony of the garden and on the cross, the divine teacher showed that prayer was the soul of his messianic ministry and paschal death, that he was dying like a, the Lamb of God, offering himself as a sacrifice. And we see this in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 which describes how Jesus was at prayer. In the days of his life on earth, he offered up prayers and entreaties with loud cries and tears to the one who could deliver him out of death. And because of his reverent attitude, his prayer was heard. By a single offering on the altar of the cross, in Hebrews 10, it's written, he has made perfect forever those who are being sanctified. So what was Jesus praying for? Praying for us. His prayer was that we would be transformed, that we would be saved, that we would know the Father as he knows the Father in this intimate relationship of love. That's what the prayer of Jesus 
bears fruit in our lives. That's what he was praying for. So how do we develop this personal prayer life? We need to understand what prayer really is, the essential components of prayer. So I'm going to identify actually about 10 of them just in, in succession. First of all, prayer is communion with God. St. Teresa of Avila said it beautifully. She wrote, prayer is an intimate conversation between friends. So if you think of, a, say, a married couple who would never spend time with one another, maybe they'd be with one another in a big group situation, but they'd never be one-on-one, -on -one, just alone together. You could imagine how that relationship would suffer, how the intimacy would, would be lacking, would dis just dissolve, would disappear and diminish over time. So it's the same way with our relationship with the Lord. Even if we're spending time with the Lord in a group situation, we need to have that alone time with God, that one-on-one, heart-to-heart -on -one, sharing. Otherwise, our intimacy with the Lord will diminish and will ultimately disappear. And, and that we don't want to happen, and neither does the Lord. So secondly, prayer is a dialogue. Like all communication, it, it requires talking and listening. <laughs> and so if we don't if we don't take that into account, we're going to have a really one-sided kind of litany, maybe of vocal prayers, um, litany of petitions, but we won't have that listening time with God. So in the Greek, the word dialogue actually means two voices, dia logos, two words. So we have the word that we're speaking to God and then the word that God is speaking to us. And the primary way that second word happens is actually through the scriptures. God speaks to us through the Word of God written, that we can hear those, basically they're like love letters that he has written to us. That we can hear what he's saying and, and discern what he's saying to us. So prayer, therefore, is relational. This dialogue is building up our relationship with God. So it's not just functional, going to God to get stuff. I need this, I need that. We don't want to treat God like a, a vending machine, right? Or, you know, as the cosmic Santa Claus or something like that. That's, a, that's not who God is. We need to relate to him as a loving father who loves us and has mercy for us, but also is calling us to grow, to change. And uh, sometimes is disciplining us and showing us areas that we need to repent in. So it's real love, real relationship that God is offering us and that we receive in prayer. So imagine if you spent time um, or you had someone in your family who every time they came over your house, you know, maybe your son or daughter or a cousin, it was always because they needed something. And the only time you ever saw them was because they had uh, a request of you. Well, what would you think about that relationship? You know, how would that make you feel? Uh, well, basically, you know, you've been reduced to uh, just providing you know, material things. And it's not really about the love uh, and, and growing in a relationship. So fourthly, our prayer time is God's time. We need to set it aside for him. God has promised to always be there. The question is, will you be there? So God is faithful to being present to us. And whether our prayer time is filled with sensible consolations, feelings of love and devotion to God, or whether it's dry as toast, God is still doing something in our prayer time. We may be uh, basking in the glory like Jesus when he was transfigured uh, at the transfiguration, or we may be going through the desert. We may be like you know, the cold body in the tomb at some time, feel like that's what our prayer is like. But in any case, we need to trust that God is there and that he's working. And he doesn't always work the way we want him to or in the way that, that you know, we would expect or think we need. But God is faithful to that time if we are faithful to that time. So there is a need for a commitment and to schedule it in. If you don't have time to pray, then there's something wrong with your priorities <laughs> because God is our first priority and our relationship with him needs to be first. So that time you spend with God will enable you to be more loving, will be enable you to be more effective in whatever tasks you have to do, 
whatever responsibilities you have to do. Now, you know, depending on your situation, your state in life, the amount of time that you spend in personal prayer each day may vary. It doesn't have to be the carbon copy of Saint so-and-so or Frank or Joe down the street or a monk or whatever, but you need to discern that. Well, wh what time am I called to spend with the Lord? And then be faithful to it. And so if you're just getting into it, start with something small and move up. <laughs> but it is God's time. Fifthly, prayer is a hunger and a thirst that should grow within us. So if we have time with the Lord, then we're going to experience at times a longing for God, that we, we, we want to be with him. <laughs> we're looking forward to that time. The scriptures speak of this. As the deer longs for running streams, so my soul is longing for you, my God. Psalm 42. In Psalm 62, O God, you are my God, for you my soul is thirsting. My body pines for you like a dry, weary land without water. On my bed, I remember you. On you, I muse through the night. You get the impression that the, the psalmist is just really caught up in his relationship with his loving father and that, that he, it preoccupies him. And that's beautiful. That's the fruit of deep prayer. So we need personal prayer each day. We need to be convinced that we need prayer more than we need oxygen. <laughs> Our spiritual life is more dependent on prayer than our natural life is dependent on the next breath that we take. That's the right attitude to have towards prayer. Personal prayer is both a decision. We have to make a decision to pray, but it's also a gift. We do not know how to pray as we ought. We need grace from God to pray. Even the desire to be with God is something that God moves within us. He's drawing us He's leading us into this relationship. And it's for our own survival. Our fa founder, Father Bob Bedard, the founder of the Companions of the Cross, uh, actually teaches us that we should have a, a holy fear of beginning our day without prayer. <laughs> in other words, we could do damage in the kingdom of God if we're not rooted in prayer. So it's for our own survival and for the well-being, the welfare of people around us to say, I, I need to pray. You know, for, for their sake and for mine. And personal prayer is something that should come from the heart. It should be an honest dialogue. God doesn't need a lecture. He's not looking for the most eloquent possible phrase you could come up with or a show that we put on for God. God doesn't need to be entertained. God wants you, the real you. Uh, one priest in our community starts his prayer time in this way. Lord, let it be the real me speaking with the real you today in prayer. That's the attitude that the Lord is looking for. He wants in on your life, not to be a spectator, <laughs> but to be a participant in your life. He wants to know your fears, your hopes, your dreams, your sorrows, what's really going on. That's the stuff that authentic prayer begins with. And that's what God want, where he wants to meet you. He knows all these things, but he wants you to invite him into those things. To, to reveal them yourself from your heart. So without prayer, we're, going, we're not going to accomplish things in the kingdom of God. With prayer, we'll be abundantly fruitful. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. In John 15. So the more one's union with God increases, the more attached you are to the vine, the more the, his action uh, will flow in your life. That, that spiritual sap, if you will, flows from the vine into the branch and leads to the fruit being born on those branches. So personal prayer is this heart-to-heart -heart time with the Lord, and we want to be careful not to have it overwhelmed or overtaken by, by devotions alone. In other words, we may have uh, certain devotional prayers, vocal prayers that we pray, a litany, um, uh, prayers of the, the rosary, other devotions. Uh, those are very good and important, but we need to also have in our personal prayer time that is uh, more free-flowing, where we can express what's going on in our hearts, where we're more spontaneous before the Lord in expressing our desires and also waiting on him in silence. So we need to make sure our prayer is balanced in this way. 
So those are the essentials for personal prayer. If we can incorporate these principles into our prayer life, then I think that's a good foundation, a good beginning to growing in holiness. And in the future talks, we're going to hear more about personal prayer, the types of prayer we engage in, and how the scriptures fit into our prayer life so that we can become one with our Savior and our Lord, Jesus Christ. This has been the first segment of Father Terry Donahue's teaching on prayer. For an audio CD or video DVD of this complete teaching, we invite you to write to us. Our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. When you write, ask for an audio CD or video DVD of the teaching by Father Terry Donahue on prayer. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue continues with his teaching on prayer. So we need to, as I mentioned before, you know, limit our intake of things that are going to distract us or confuse us or lie to us and open up our intake of God's truths. You know, whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, whatever is worthy of praise, fix our, our thoughts on these things. Jesus says in John 15, I chose you. You did not choose me. These are unbelievably <laughs> consoling words, especially for folks who've been on the path for a long time. We look at where we're at and we're, when we make a self-assessment, we're, we're thinking, you know, I haven't maybe progressed spiritually like I thought I would have by now. There's certain dreams that are yet unrealized. I'm having a tough time overall. And there are things that we're, there are problems in our spiritual life or in our families or in our ministries even that we're trying to solve and we're just not getting anywhere. And so that's why the words of Jesus are so consoling. Because what he's trying to say, trying to mind us is, this was my idea. Your relationship with me was my idea. I started this. I initiated this. All the things that I have directed you to do over many months, many years, those were my ideas. So what is in the heart of Jesus will be fulfilled. What is in the heart of Jesus will happen. But he does need a few things from us. The realization of these dreams and of these plants that God talks about in Jeremiah 29. These plans that he has for us, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Plans to give us a hope and a future. These will be fulfilled. But he requires our cooperation. And there's a number of things he needs. Not necessarily in this order, but one of them is wisdom. Have we tried to implement the dreams and the plans that God has given us? Are we at a point right now where we're saying, you know, if you want to get something done, you've got to do it yourself. Is that, is that what is driving our spirituality? Maybe the Lord is saying, trust me. Yes, what you see, <laughs> what you see through your eyes tells you that nothing's happening. And I want you to come to me and say, Lord, this was your idea. You called me to this. 
you're going to see me through whether this is spiritual growth, whether this is the service that you're involved with, whether it is the salvation of your family, all these things that you know God wants, but you're, not, you're just not so sure anymore. Jesus wants you to know those things are my ideas. I started it and I will finish it. And so part of the word from Jeremiah 29.11 is plans to give us hope. That if we're in this place right now, you know, between the dream and the fulfillment of the dream, the gap that Jesus places in there is hope. A great hope in him. Because what he started, he will finish. And in the meantime, he wants to build intimacy with us. He wants to bring us to this place where we can say, Lord, you are so good. You are so good. That's where he wants to bring us. Because that's a place of freedom. That despite what we see, we can be absolutely filled with hope. So that's what I find myself doing now. I find I have these mornings where I just, four mornings out of five, I wake up with a little bit of a cloud over my bed. I'm just kind of feeling, oh, a little bit negative about the day. What's going to happen today? And just through a series of events, I've been led to just proclaim the goodness of the Lord. Lord, you are so good. And I, might, I recall those things that he's, that he's done that go, yeah, that was so great what you did there, and so great what you did there, and so great what you did there. And that hope cuts the discouragement like a knife. He's called us. He's called us. It's his idea. And he has, we're going to realize those dreams and goals that he's given us. One of those goals, as Jesus says, is that we will bear fruit. Fruit that will last. You did not chose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. How does that work? How does it work that we can, that Jesus will give us whatever we ask in his name? Here's how it works. In this time where we do not see the realization of our dreams... If we take that time and we say, Lord, you are so good. I place my trust in you. We come into this intimacy with God, an unprecedented intimacy with God where we can pray more effectively in his will. <laughs> that time of maturing, that time of what I'll call the gap between the dream and the realization of the dream. If we approach it, realizing that Jesus started this program in the first place, we can get to such intimacy with God so that when we pray, there's just a, a, a higher probability that we're going to pray in his will. The fruit. Galatians 5.22. Joy, peace, endurance, kindness. These are many of the fruits that Jesus is calling us to bear. Again, because he's chosen it for us, he's going to make it happen. And we have to find that place, that balance. And this is, you know, this is always the tricky part in the spiritual life. And, and we can even see this from reading the spiritual writers. It's, it's negotiating, okay, how much, of, how much of this am I to trust the Lord and how much of it am I supposed to do? How do I navigate that? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that helps us navigate Okay, am I just working in the flesh here? Am I just trying to make something happen? Or am I being obedient to something God wants me to do? So the Holy Spirit is absolutely key. And so once again, we need to invite the Holy Spirit, that master of the interior life, to guide us so that we can bear that fruit that Jesus wants us to bear. Father, we, just, we thank you for this tremendous calling on our lives. Lord, we thank you for these these wonderful plans you have for us, not to harm us, but to prosper us, to give us a future with such great hope. Lord, maybe we're at a point where we're a little bit disillusioned, 
things, there's things that haven't happened that we would have expected to happen by now and we're struggling to trust you. Nevertheless, Lord, we make a decision to trust in your goodness today, Lord. Show us, have your Holy Spirit show us those things that we've done that we've taken into our own hands because we feel maybe you haven't delivered. Show us those areas where we need to pull back and show us those other areas where maybe you've been leading us to respond, but we, do haven't, we don't see the value of it, maybe because it's behind the door once we go through it. So Father, we just ask you, ask you to send your Holy Spirit to be able to discern where we're supposed to trust in Jesus and where we're supposed to act. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. I have the great privilege of reading many, many wonderful letters that come to Food for Life. And so often I am completely blessed when I read some of the kind words that you share. It really touches my heart. I want to read a few of those letters to you today. The first one comes from a viewer who writes, Thank you for your ongoing programs. I find them enriching and a wonderful supplement to scripture studies in my faith journey. They often clarify areas I've been struggling with. Thank you again. Another person writes this. As always, Food for Life continues to be a strong weapon of the Lord in bringing His people to know Him more deeply and give them hope and trust they need to live in today's world and to have peace. The teachings on Food for Life offer us all a challenge to recognize the sovereignty of Jesus as Lord and King of the universe. And finally, another viewer writes and says, Enclosed, please find a contribution to help with the program. I'm alone and I'm in ill health. I cannot go out alone, but a family member takes me to church. When I return, I watch Food for Life and I find it very inspiring and comforting. Thank you and God bless you. I was so touched by these and many other letters that we get. We really do appreciate the feedback that we get. And some people even have suggestions. We appreciate all sorts of feedback. It really means a lot. And I'm hoping that as I've read these letters to you today, if you've been watching Food for Life for some time and you find that the program's a blessing to you, and if you feel that the Lord would lead you to support the program financially and in prayer, we'd like to hear from you. It's only through the faithful, prayerful, and financial support of people like you that Food for Life can continue. So if you feel so led, we'd like you to join us in sharing the good news. Please write to us at Food for Life. For an audio CD or video DVD of today's ministry, we invite you to write to us. When you write, mention the program number 1449 and today's topic, Father Terry Donahue on prayer. Food for Life is a non-profit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax-deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. If you have never donated before, we ask that you make your check payable to Food for Life, and our address is Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2T8. You may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Terry Donahue continues with his teaching on prayer. So we need to, as I mentioned before, you know, limit our intake of things that are going to distract us or confuse us or lie to us and open up our intake of God's truths. You know, whatever is true, whatever is good, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, whatever is worthy of praise, fix our, our thoughts on these things. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry.